Today is the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. And the epistle is taken from St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Brethren, see that you walk circumspectly, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, become not unwise, but rather understanding, which is the will of God. And be not drunk with wine, for this is luxury, but be filled rather with the Holy Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual canticles, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God and the Father being subject one to another in the fear of Christ. Please stand for the Gospel. The Gospel reading is taken from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time, there was a certain ruler whose son was sick at Capernaum. And he, having heard that Jesus was come from Judea into Galilee, went to Jesus and asked him to come down and heal his son, for his son was at the point of death. Jesus therefore saith to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The ruler said to him, Lord, come down before my son dies. Jesus said to him, Go thy way, thy son lives. The man believed the word which Jesus said to him and went his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him. And they brought word saying that his son lived. He asked them, therefore, the hour wherein his son had got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. The father therefore knew that it was at the same hour that Jesus had said to him, Thy son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This is the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> We have some announcements. The Mass today is offered, this evening, is offered for the repose of the soul of Bill Volpinest. We also remember Mary, the members of our parish family who died this week, especially Freddie Williams. The second offering today is for World Mission Sunday. And the Knights of Columbus are sponsoring our Oktoberfest celebration on Saturday, November 11th, after the 4.30 Mass. Father Alvin Yu, Master of Ceremonies to the Archbishop, will be offering a solemn high requiem for our faithful departed on All Souls Day, November 2nd, at 6.30. He will be assisted by Father Ilo and Father Chung. Join the fun and support our school at the annual Stella Morris Gala on Saturday, November the 4th. Our annual stewardship renewal weekends are coming up later this month when we plan our prayer, our service, and financial giving for the year. Next week's second offering is for STARS Outreach to the Homeless. And details on all these events can be found in the weekly bulletins available at the doors of the church. In today's gospel, a royal official who was probably a Gentile and very possibly a centurion, because the synoptics have an account that is very similar to this, it may be a different miracle, or it may be the same miracle, somewhat differently recounted. But this man, this Gentile, this royal official, goes to Jesus and asks Jesus to go down to his house and restore his dying son to health. Jesus' initial response is to rebuke and to challenge him. Jesus says to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Clearly, what Jesus requires is faith. And for those who have faith, signs and wonders are not necessary. 
So Jesus says to him, return home, your son lives. And the man believes on the word of Jesus. The word of Jesus is sufficient for the man, as the gospel reports, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and left and went home. In today's gospel and throughout the New Testament, there is enormous emphasis on the requirement, the prerequisite of faith that Jesus makes or requires whenever he performs a miracle. Remember in Nazareth where there was no faith, no miracles were performed. So it's very important that we make a distinction here between supernatural faith, which is the faith that Jesus requires, the kind of faith that is indispensably necessary for salvation, and natural faith. Now, St. Thomas in the Summa Theologiae, in the second part of the second, question four, articles one and eight, gives us a definition of faith. St. Thomas writes, faith is that supernatural habit of mind whereby eternal life begins in us. Faith is that supernatural habit of mind which brings the intellect or moves the intellect to assent to things that appear not. So if we look at the elements of that definition, the first element is that it is a supernatural habit. Faith is a supernatural gift of God. It is one of the three theological virtues. Faith is given at baptism with sanctifying grace. And faith cannot be acquired, supernatural faith, the theological virtue of faith, cannot be acquired by human effort. It is infused, not acquired. The second element in the definition is that faith is a habit. More specifically, it's a morally and supernaturally good habit which consists in an abiding, constant disposition to exert a certain determinate kind of action. In other words, faith is a constant disposition, an abiding disposition, a stable disposition that inclines us or moves us and enables us to act in a certain way. Now the proper action of the virtue of faith is the action of believing. To believe means to accept as true a proposition on the basis of the testimony of reliable witnesses. Means trusting then others to speak the truth and to accurately depict what it is that they are representing. <coughs> Believing, especially with regard to supernatural faith, is the action of giving unqualified, unreserved intellectual assent to certain kinds of truths. So when we're talking about supernatural faith, we're, calling, we're talking about a virtue that inspires and enables and moves the intellect to give unqualified assent to certain truths, certain propositions, certain statements. And the truths with which supernatural faith is concerned are certain truths about God and about how we are related to God. And so St. Thomas writes, faith disposes us to believe certain truths about the unseen first truth, that is God, and certain matters that we hold because we believe on the testimony of the first truth. Specifically, supernatural faith, the theological virtue of faith, 
has as its object truths about God that are not accessible to unaided human reason. That means that the truths to which faith gives assent are truths that require to be revealed by God. They cannot be discerned or discovered by natural processes of intellectual ratiocination. Now at this point we have to make an important distinction. There are truths about God that are accessible to unaided human reason. There are truths about God that can be known without supernatural faith, without divine positive revelation. For example, the existence of God. God here is taken as the source of all beings, himself having no source, the uncaused cause, the origin and the uncaused cause of all finite being, the supreme being who transcends all things and yet is present to all things and yet is separate, eternally, infinitely separate from all things. The same God is the one without a second. He is not part of a series or of a class or category. He transcends and is beyond all classes and categories. He is the source of moral and ontological order in the universe. And the order in the universe, both ontological and moral, reflects the plan, the design of God, according to which he created the universe. These truths about God are called facts about God, subrazione de extremi causa. In other words, these are truths about Almighty God that can be known simply by the use of human reason, by the application of human reason to empirical data, the analysis of that data in the light of the first principles of the speculative intellect, the use of logic and argumentation can move one to the conclusion God as supreme being exists. We can also know that God is provident, which is to say that the universe reflects God's plan and the universe is ruled and governed and subject, ruled and governed by God and subject to him in all things. Now this is knowledge about God that is accessible with natural faith, without supernatural faith, and without divine positive revelation. It's also true that we can know certain marks or attributes of God. We can know them simply by, again, the process of human reasoning. For example, we can know that God is simple, not composed of parts, that he is spiritual and indivisible. We can know that God is absolutely perfect and the ground and foundation and source of all being, of all perfection, of all existence. We can know that God, because he is absolute goodness, is the purpose on account of which all things were created. All things are meant to manifest God. They are meant to be assimilated in some way to God according to the capacity that they have. We can know that God is infinite and therefore that no circumscriptive knowledge about God is possible. Circumscriptive knowledge is knowledge that actually gets around the subject, can contain the subject can comprehensively grasp and understand the subject. There is no way, not even in heaven, will we have an exhaustive, comprehensive knowledge of the infinite God. We know God in this life by way of analogy, by way of comparison and contrast with the things that we do know. We know God 
by way of removing certain imperfections that don't belong to him. For example, when we say God is infinite, that means he's not finite, he's not limited. There are no boundaries. There's no succession or progression. We know God because they, by way of certain formal perfections that in and of themselves have no intrinsic principle of limit. We know, for example, that God is perfect knowledge, perfect love. We know that love and knowledge as applied to God don't mean exactly the same thing as they do when applied to us, but that there is some similarity. Actually, it's a similarity based on the analogy of proper proportionality. We can know that God is unchangeable, unalterable, immutable. He is pure act with no potentiality. Nothing he can become because he is everything. We know that God is eternal, no beginning, no end, no progression, no succession. All these truths about God can be known by natural faith, the application of reason and logic and argumentation to data that is accessible to us. In fact, Vatican I, I am saying Vatican I, in the dogmatic constitution on the Catholic faith, chapter two, Revelation, teaches that God, as the beginning and end of all things, may be known with certainty, certainty, by the natural light of human reason, by the application of logic and argumentation to creating things that are accessible to our knowledge. Remember St. Paul, don't they? Per eo que viso sunt, from the things that are known, seen, the invisible.